Hundreds of track and field stars representing the best in the nation descend upon Modesto, California for the 14th annual California Relays. In the Modesto Junior College Stadium, the stage was set for some record-breaking performances, and the athletes didn't disappoint as they set three new world standards. The timber toppers are off and running in the 120-yard high hurdles. Willard Wright of the Los Angeles Athletic Club repeats his West Coast Relays victory to make it two big ones in a row. Time 14 and 3 tenths seconds. West Santee, third from the right, momentarily abandons his search for the sub four minute mile and concentrates on lowering the 880 yard standard. But the Kansas Cowboy is going to have a rough time of it. Opposing him is Lance Burrier of the Lackland Air Force Base, who is awaiting recognition of his recent world shattering performance at this distance. At the halfway points, Burrier is leading with Santee in second place. In the final dash to the wire, it's Wes Santee showing the way and winning in world record time of 1 minute 48 and 5 tenths seconds. Just one tenth of a second faster than the old standard, but slower than Spurrier's best time. Both have been submitted for recognition as new world's records. Southern California's sensational Ernie Shelton makes it up and over to capture the high jump. The bark of the starter's gun sends nine speedy sprinters away in quest of the 100-yard dash honors. And it's California freshman Lehman King who runs away with the event in nine and four ten seconds. Whenever there's a gathering of pole vaulters, one man will stand out above all others. Bob Richards, the high-flying parson from California. At this meet, Bob soared 15 feet three inches, the highest he or any other man has vaulted this year. The current world record in the 440-yard relay is 40 and 5 tenths seconds, held jointly by Southern California and the University of Texas. The Texas team of Dean Smith, Alvin Friedman, Jerry Pruitt, and Bobby Wilden combines its talents to make every yard a winning one. This fast-moving foursome, with Wilden on the pole running the anchor leg, lowers the world 440-yard relay mark to 40 and 2 tenths seconds. Texas also captured the 880-yard relay and the two-mile relay, giving the Longhorns a triple win for the meet. Bud Held, representing the Olympic Club, lets loose the javelin on his fourth and final try, a tremendous heave that sends the spear sailing to a world mark of 268 feet, two and a half inches. Bud Hell climaxes one of the most outstanding performances in the annals of track and field. Hill and the Paul Bunyan Arts mingle with high good fellowship when nine collegiate teams descend upon the hills of Meriden, New Hampshire for the ninth annual Woodsman's Weekend. All the contestants in this woodchopper's ball are pretty sharp and so are the axes. This little shaver is a razor blade saver, but you can't be thin skinned. Most people consider this work. These fellows go at it as if it were fun. Chopping through eight inches of white pine is no easy matter, especially when racing against the clock. But the collegiate campers are hardened to the rugged toils of the tall timbers, and with a few well-placed blows, the task is terminated. Grandma, what big teeth you have, said the log to the saw. Better to cut you with, replied the razor sharp strip of steel. And cut it does, quick and easy. Pull, don't push, is the secret to the two-man crosscut, as it takes less than 10 seconds to slice through a 14-inch log. With Dartmouth leading the rest of the teams at the end of nine events, the outcome of the canoe races could decide the weekend winner. Middlebury takes the two-man race, but it's Dartmouth once more coming through in the tight spots and capturing the single paddle canoe event. There's plenty of action in the one-man portage race. Each man shoulders a pack board, hoists the canoe on it, then runs 25 yards to the water, and after launching the canoe, the contestant jumps aboard and paddles the course at top speed. Those Dartmouth Indians are at home in the woods as they wrap up another first place 
to help seal their weekend victory. And the Davy Crockett's of the Dartmouth Outing Club provide the biggest thrill of the two-day field and stream Olympics with a great performance in the tree felling contest. A match is placed in a stake that can be no less than 12 feet from the tree that is to be felled. The object is to drop the tree as close to the stakes as possible within a five minute time limit. If you hit the stake, you're just about perfect. If you light the match, everybody else quits and goes home. The contest is over. Herb Wall is doing the honors for Dartmouth and this young sophomore from Trenton, New Jersey realizes that a nice eye and a steady hand are all important. Herb, working very methodically, pauses from time to time to go back to the stake and make sure his chopping will cause the tree to fall in the right spot. Now comes the most ticklish part of the whole operation, for when the tree is ready to fall, the last few strokes of the axe can mean the difference between a direct hit and a distant miss. Timber! And the tree scores a bullseye! Herb Wall deserves all the praise for a victory well earned and a match well burned. As the action-packed woodsman's weekend comes to a close, one of the losers just doesn't care what he does to his nose. Happy days are here again for the Boston Red Sox. Their big gun, Theodore Samuel Ted Williams, is back in harness. Ted finally returned to the Sox after providing baseball fans with a long string of speculation as to whether or not he would come back. Manager Pinky Higgins, along with every fan in the nation, is mighty happy to have the big guy back in uniform. Ted boasts a lifetime batting average of 348 in a 13-year career that was twice interrupted by hitches in military service. Ted slips on a pair of gloves to protect his hands from blisters as he works himself into playing shape. Billy Goodman and outfielder Jimmy Pearsall kid with Big Ted as he gets ready for some batting practice. Five times, Williams has captured the American League batting crown, RBI laurels, and home run derby. His top hitting performance was in 1941 when he posted an amazing 406. Manager Higgins is hoping for moral as well as physical support from the big guy who owns 1,937 lifetime major league hits. Included among these are 395 doubles and 366 home runs. Baseball needs Williams and he's back with the good wishes of everyone in the nation for a great season. In the National League, Duke Snyder continues to pace the front-running Brooklyn Dodger attack. Duke is among the leaders in home runs and runs batted in. Big Jim Hearn has returned to top form for the defending world champion New York Giants. Jim posted his sixth win of the infant campaign against the Milwaukee Braves. New York's dependable Don Mueller tied the all-time giant mark held by Freddie Lindstrom by hitting in his 24th straight game against Milwaukee. Mueller leads the senior circuit in batting with an average well over 375. The Milwaukee Braves received a tough break when slugging star Eddie Matthews was sidelined with an appendectomy. Matthews should be back in three weeks. Veteran second baseman Red Shandings has been one of the mainstays of the St. Louis Cardinals' recent surge. Hitting over 330, Red is headed for another banner season. Chicago Cub manager Stan Hack is happy over the surprising play of his Bruins. Gene Baker, shown here, along with Ernie Banks, forms a double play combination that is the hub of the Chicago attack. Chicago fans hope the Cubs can keep up their fast pace. Only time will tell. The annual Kansas City Golf Tournament featured fairway artists from far and near in a par-shattering battle over the rolling Hillcrest Country Club. Before tee-off time, Kerry Middlecoff, pre-tournament favorite, chats with Bud Holscher and Peter Thompson. 
Middlecoff is the 1955 Masters champion. Bud Holscher from Apple Valley, California is one of the most promising young swingers in the game. Peter Thompson is the Australian and former British Open champion. Kerry Middlecoff tees off on the final round of the 72-hole tournament. Middlecoff currently is the third leading money winner on the circuit. San Francisco's Bob Rosberg is out to improve his position of eighth leading money winner. Doug Higgins, a slender belter from the Lone Star State, is a comparative newcomer to tournament competition. He tees off in fourth place. Parr really takes a beating on the final round. On the 18th, Fred Wampler, former intercollegiate champ from Purdue University, barely misses a 15-footer. Gene Littler from Palm Springs, who recently won the Las Vegas jackpot, cans a beauty here, but finishes in eighth place. Mike Fedgick is having a little trouble on the greens. I know how he feels. Mike taps in his remaining putt for an even par score, but only subpar golf brings home the bacon in this tournament. Coming into the 18th, Dr. Kerry Middlecoff bangs his approach a good 20 feet from the pin. The Memphis dentist carded a 68 the first day, put together another 68 on his second round, then ran into a cool putter and scored a 72 on his third round. He takes plenty of time on this one, for one stroke can mean ninth position or fifth place. He strokes, but the ball rims the cup and Carey finishes in ninth place. Jackie Burke in fourth position at the start of today's round misses a heartbreaker and winds up a stroke behind Middlecoff. Dick Mayer, the leader after the first 54 holes, almost dunks his chip shot as the ball rolls over the hole and three feet beyond. Chandler Harper, the veteran campaigner from Portsmouth, Virginia, has been red hot in the last several tournaments. Last week, he captured the Colonial Invitational at Fort Worth. He studies his putt carefully on the 18th. Takes plenty of time. Then strokes. The ball rims the cup, and Harper finishes 10 strokes under par and nails down second place. Dick Mayer started the day as the leader, and the 31-year-old swinger from St. Petersburg, Florida, finishes with a blistering 67 to finish 17 under par and six strokes better than Harper. <laughs> Mayer, ranked 28th in money winnings this year, picks up the winner's check of $4,000 to more than double his previous 45 rounds on the tournament trail. This isn't a man from Mars, but he's all the way from Japan, ready to do battle in the ancient and honorable sport of kendo. Kendo, which means the art of the sword, is the Japanese counterpart of fencing, with stout bamboo clubs taking the place of the traditional heavy curved saber. These implements of the sport are about four feet long and weigh approximately the same as a baseball fungal bat. A duel is won by landing the most blows on certain parts of the body, mostly the head, making this a good place for an aspirin salesman. This Boston demonstration of the ancient Japanese sport is believed to be the first seen in this country. However, action sequences of kendo duels with real swords are a part of the award-winning Japanese film, Gate of Hell. Footwork plays an important part in kendo, but the main idea is to keep your head out of trouble. One good crack on the noggin could mean a visit from the Japanese Sandman. Many dances have been held in this particular room, but the mambo was never like this. The man-manufactured mayhem continues through two out of three bouts. In spite of the padding, there's plenty of bruised bait in the exposed areas, and these fellows are determined to cover every square inch. Only certain blows count, but uh, they all hurt. After all is said and done, our Japanese friends are all smiles, but they'll be black and blue tomorrow. 
The more than 42,000 race goers who heeded the headlines and made their way to Hollywood Park in Englewood, California, were in for an afternoon of thoroughbred thrills. They were hopeful of seeing Swaps, the Kentucky Derby winner, in action. But co-owners Ellsworth and Tenney had other plans. It was to be number six, Bequeath, carrying the red and black Ellsworth colors in the debonair stakes. The handsome three-year-old colt is not only a stablemate of the famous Swaps, but was sired by the same stallion, Collard. Film star Gary Cooper, Rex Ellsworth, Bequeath's owner, and General Omar Bradley are probably still talking about an earlier race in which El Drag, another of Swap's stablemates and son of Khalid, set a new world's record for seven furlongs. Now here are the entrants for the debonair stakes. Number one is Mr. Sullivan and 1A, Guerrero. Ray York is aboard number two, the Andy Krevlin colt, Golden Land. Gilton Madero is number three. Bo Busher, number four, looms as one of the top competitors. Number five is Merlot, and rounding out the starting field is Bequeath, capably handled by the nation's winningest jockey, Willie Shoemaker. This is a six furlong test, restricted to three-year-old colts and geldings. Sometimes it takes a little coaxing to get these spirited chargers into the starting gate. Now they're all in position and waiting for the bell. And they're off. First away in the light silks is Mr. Sullivan. Guerrero on the far outside moves up to challenge for the lead. Running third along the rail is Bequeath. Now it's Guerrero taking command. Bequeath slipping through on the inside goes after the leader. And Mr. Sullivan falls back to third. Down the back stretch, Guerrero sets a torrid pace with Bequeath right on his heels. And the others starting to move up. Rounding the turn into the home stretch, Guerrero along the rail maintains a slight lead as Bequeath goes wide and allows Mr. Sullivan to slip between horses and take command. But Willie Shoemaker and Bequeath come on strong and flash across the finish, a length and a half in front of Mr. Sullivan, with Guerrero holding on for third. The trip to the winner's circle is certainly a familiar one to Willie Shoemaker, who brought Bequeath home in one minute, nine and one-fifth seconds to win the debonair stakes. It looks like Rex Ellsworth and Mickey Tenney are out to establish a California dynasty with Swaps, El Drag, and Bequeath, three fast-flying sons of Khalid.